question, uh, Tobias. Um, so I think here the outperform 19 general pathologist is definitely not saying like, oh, the model can do everything pathologist is doing. It is outperforming 19 general pathologists on this particular task. Uh, and I think you mentioned a good point. It's like the amount of data that we are showing to these, uh, to, with the amount of data that we're sh using to train the machine learning system uh, potentially might be more than what the pathologist that they have received. Uh, in the next study, uh, which there's the data that I didn't show, is what we saw that the general pathologists, when they are engaging, working with us, uh, their diagnostic performance actually go up through time because they have seen what that, so they are stepping back a bit. They are general pathologists, so they kind of like look at all kinds of different cases. They're not like prostate urologists, subspecialists. Um, but the fact that they work with us, they see way more prostate cancer cases than they would have seen in their daily clinical practice, their performance actually go up. So there's indeed a possibility, like we did not do that, we did not do that uh, evaluation of like, if we show the model the same amount of data versus a human, uh, whether, uh, which one performs better. That's actually something that we kind of like, we, we have been talking about it as a potential intern project for like years. Uh, we wanted to do, cause I looking at pathology images is not something People typically know how to do it, right? If you, if we, if we randomly find like a like, let's say myself when I was like well, when I was doing undergrad, I know nothing. I I'm not able to interpret that slice. So we always want to do a study as like seeing the uh, showing the same amount of data to like human versus to a model, whether which one uh, actually performs better. But that's a that's an idea that I hope someone actually do that study. I, we haven't got a chance to work on that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, so here, then what we do is like, after having like a high performing model, the next thing that we do is we want to figure out like, can an AI assistant actually help the pathologist, uh, and potentially change the pathologist's mind about classification. So this is what we are trying to do is we're trying to integrate the model into a potential simulated clinical workflow. This on the left, this is what it looks like. Typically, uh, there, this is like on the digital pathology workflow, pathology, pathologists see the tissues, and then we're trying to see what are the information that we can share to the pathologist assisting them, such that potentially they can do the diagnosis more accurately and then more efficiently. This particular task is very different from a lot of like, people might've heard of computer-aided diagnos diagnostics uh, on like X-ray or on like CT, uh, those a lot of those tasks more of like a detection task. Detection is like look at images and say, hey, like ask the doctor say, hey, look at this area. There might be a tumor over there. But for this particular task, pathologists they see all the tissue. Like these tissue is there. There aren't that it's, it's a it's a tiny piece of tissue. They actually can they actually see through all of those. The thing that we're trying to do is in terms of gla uh, prostate uh, Gleason pattern the categorization between pattern two and pattern three, pattern three and pattern four, whether we can kind of like change pathologist's mind in terms of like whether they they will like follow what AI suggests or they will like ignore what AI suggests. So what we did is we have uh, a study, which is like 20 US birth cert certified pathologists. We have 240 biopsies. And then we designed a crossover study, which like we split the 20 pathologists into two groups. The first group look at like AI assisted first, followed by without AI assisted. And then uh, the second group do the other order. There's a four weeks washout period in between. And this is uh, this is a single figure of a year of our life. So kind of like this is it's a figure we call it a rainbow chart. I, I love this figure. Let me kind of walk you through how to read this one. Every single row here is a pathologist uh, diagnosis. Every single column is a case. Uh, top is AI assisted, bottom is without AI assisted. Color is the different uh, diagnosis ranging from no tumor, grade group one to grade group four, five. And then the bottom text is the ground truth. So no tumor, grade group one, all the way to grade group four, five. If you look at, let's say, this particular case, for example, which is like the last case in the no tumor, you see like a bunch of like red dots and you see a bunch of like gray dots, right? This is suggesting for exactly the same case being seen by a group of 20 pathologists, uh, roughly, I don't know, like eight, six or eight of them, say it's group four or five. Group four or five is like 
this prostate cancer, this patient likely should go through like prostatectomy, get the prostate removed. For the for the gray, it's like no tumors, like no tumors, like you're fine, like you're fine, you can just go go back home. And this is like the this is the 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 natural like interpathologist that we're talking about. Uh, and you see the speckleness that just like over the place. And that's the this is the uh, a visualization of the interpathologist variability. And we found that with AI's assistant, you see, if you compare the bottom with the top, you see it actually becomes like cleaner. It's not like fully clean. It's not like oh, completely gray, but you see it becomes cleaner here. For this particular middle area, it becomes cleaner, it becomes cleaner. If you look at the quantitative score, the accuracy went from like 69% to 75%. Uh, this is on the accuracy aspect. We also measured the time, and it actually leads to an improvement in terms of efficiency. We also did a questionnaire about um, about their confidence, like for these pathologies, what's their confidence about their diagnosis, and we also see an improvement in terms of confidence. So this is a suggestion, like with uh, the a high performance model with the right UI, and then also one of the key aspect about the study is the onboarding process of bringing this technology. Bring showing this technology to the pathologist, we actually have a, a very a carefully curated onboarding process to share our detailed validation results with all the single doctor about how these models were developed, how these models were validated, what are essentially kind of like the, the, the like the, the technical detail, how these models uh, validated, where are the validation ground truth label comes from, and then where where are the area the model works well, where are the area the model uh is like not performing that well and having these like very well curated onboarding process actually help the pathologist and gaining trust which is a topic that i think we discussed a bit over lunch uh gaining trust about the system and actually potentially help them in changing how they look at the results yes Bianca. okay i really find this problem interesting uh, my question is uh about it seems to me that the AI assistant is more likely to assume that the later stage is classified as an earlier stage. And I'm wondering when you decide on accuracy, do you take into consideration, you know, whether uh you know sometimes I, I think that you know I'm not I'm not working with clinical samples, but I would assume that I would rather somebody want to predict them in a later stage in order to accelerate treatment rather than predict the opposite. Do you mm -hmm. take into consideration those type of decisions when you evaluate on whether, you yeah. know, is there a reason for that? Because I feel like maybe the human is a bit more apprehensive to be like, okay, like, let me assume a bit more the worst to make yeah. sure I prepare properly. You feel? Yeah, I think that's actually a great, great, great point. So I think first and foremost for the, the ground, like here there's like the ground truth, right? And there's like, how, how is the ground truth defined? The ground truth here is being defined by three kind of like the world expert, they wrote the guideline of how right now we should do increase and grading, and then they do a majority vote among the three of them. So this is like how the ground truth is defined. We did not intentionally incorporate the notion about like, kind of like leaning toward like undergrading or a bit overgrading, because I think we want to aim for as accurate as possible. But I think that's a good sec, that's a good topic that I'll, I'll talk about in a couple of slides is, Ultimately, I think like what we would like the model to do, to do is to provide a very accurate risk assessment and then kind of decouple it a bit into like first having a very accurate risk assessment. And the second is based on just like the accurate risk assessment, people, do they want to take a more aggressive or they take a more conservative uh, treatment decision? So, and let's, let's talk about the further discuss it in like maybe like in, in, in two slides. So this is like kind of like the the study uh, the study that 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 we did, and and I think so far we have we have seen that okay like AI can do well on like recent scoring, uh, and we show that it has potential to help a pathologist in doing better work in recent grading. Um, we then kind of like start to think more about like then what's next right like um, and before going there we kind of like trying to step back a bit and think about essentially Bianca, like what do you ask like what is what is the goal of like Gleason scoring? So here's a little bit of history about Gleason scoring. This is Dr. Donald Gleason, who's a, a pathologist at the, at uh, at VA, and at the right, which is the the original figure he drew in his very first publication, in 1966, of like the Gleason uh, scoring patterns. Right, one, two, three, four, five. You see that, and that's like we have changes a little bit, but it's largely the same today. Um, 
the study, uh, what Dr. Gleason, what he did, he, he, he's a prostate uh, um, pathologist and he has seen lots of cases and he, he designed the scoring system and it was initially validated on a group of like roughly 270 patients showing that if you do scoring based on this kind of system, it can lead to good, good uh, risk stratification. And it was it was then validated on about like uh, 1,032 cases on the prognosis. Overall, recent scoring is all about risk stratification. It wanted to provide an accurate risk stratification about like what is the potential risk for a particular patient, and then use that risk stratification to decide what's the best downstream uh, treatment. So then we try to. The next question we're trying to ask is, if Gleason scoring is about risk stratification, like the ground truth here isn't really the end goal. The end goal here, we should really aim for to see how well does our model perform in terms of risk stratification. And that's one of the studies that we did. Um, we, we, we want to answer the question, how well can our AI-based Gleason score predict outcomes directly? Uh, here, what we do is we use a data set of roughly uh, uh, 2,800 uh, prostatectomy cases with a median of 13 years follow-up. And then we do um, uh, a study of like directly predicting out, uh, outcomes uh, using a survival analysis from the input data. And here, what you see is we have two validation data sets. Um, and we found that the AI predicted risk score in terms of like C in this index. C index is a, a metric that often we use in the survival analysis uh, that it actually outperformed. So it's comparing this number with this number. So it's 0.87 uh, uh, C index versus 0.79, which is the C index and performing outcome by the pathologist grade groups. And I think this is like an interesting result. It shows that like the AI system, uh, we show that it cannot not it can do very well in terms of assigning patient to these like bucket of like great group one, great group two, great group three, great group four, five. Uh, it can also do directly predicting risk um, more accurately. And then we dive deeper into it of like how can the AI actually do that? And going back a little bit, it's like like Lisa's Lisa's story is looking at these patterns and AI is really like our deep learning system is really good at doing very fine grained quantification of the different Gleason pattern. Like AI, like deep learning, like, like neural network can count pixels, right? Can count pixels of like, oh, there's like, like 512 pixels is Gleason pattern three, like 201 pixel is like Gleason pattern four. Those type of like very fine grained quantification helps improve the ability for the predicted risk score in doing risk stratification. So this is like a sequence of work that we have that we have done uh, in the in the prostate cancer space, starting from developing a system showing that it can outperform human level performance in Gleason grade group. We show that it can integrate into a simulated clinical workflow, increasing the accuracy, efficiency, confidence, and then we show that taking exactly the same system, it can help predict uh, risk, like patient risk, uh, accurately. So this sets the foundation into like the next steps of like. The thing that we're figuring out is like, it's a topic like how can humans learn from AI? Um, so let's dive a little bit into the aspects of like AI directly predicting outcomes for cancer patient management, like risk stratification is a very key step uh, for the downstream treatment. And we would like to see whether AI can directly learn from the data in directly predicting outcomes. For all the work previously, there's always an intermediate step, which is based on the human annotation. As AI is essentially learning from the human annotation. But, but if outcome is the thing that ultimately matters, can we take the human annotation out directly, like as like a deep learning purist? Can we go end to end, go from raw input data directly to the outcomes? And so this is a, a high level overview of this particular section of the, the work. Essentially, there are three parts. The first part is we can we develop the model directly in predicting outcomes end to end. Input a bunch of unannotated images, output is risk. If we can do that, can we derive some signals 
can we interpret what the model is doing? And can we derive something that that, that human can understand? And then if we can do that, can we use that knowledge that we have learned to train pathologists and then replicate whatever the model is doing in step number one? So this is kind of like the high level outline of this particular section. So here we set up the question like we wanted to train a model fully end to end, input a bunch of pathology slides, output directly outcomes. This is very different from the previous Gleason scoring uh, task. The Gleason scoring task for every single patient, let's say a patient we have 10 slides, every single slide we can split it into like a bunch of small image patches, every single slide we can probably do like 100,000 or even 1 million patch depending on how you want to split it. So assuming 1 million uh, uh, patches per slide, right? And let's say we have one slide, we have 100 patients that give us 100 million input output pairs. And like, this is a lot of data for us, for us to train a model going from input to Gleason, Gleason patterns. But here we want to directly predicting outcomes. Outcomes, let's, let's say like survival, let's say like, like five-year survival, 10-year survival, depending on what kind of input we want to select. It is a patient level notion of, uh, it's associated at the patient level, not at like the patch level. It drastically shifts the data paradigm from hundreds of millions of input output pairs to, I don't know, hundreds or even thousands of input output pairs. And it went from like a strongly supervised learning to like something, I think we call it like a weakly supervised learning where the supervision signal is very weak. We have a, a bunch of images and we only have like one label per, per patient. And this drastically changed how uh, the, the foundational definition of this particular problem. So in this particular study, uh, we were very fortunate to be able to partner with University of Graz. Um, they have a data set of roughly 5,000 patients with up to 30 years of follow-up. And which is like, from my perspective, it's like world heritage uh, because the PI there has a foresight to do this like 30 years ago. But then now we have that opportunity to use that particular data set. And then we'll see whether we can train a model and directly end to end going from input pixels to output survival. And this is a, this is a result. These are on two independent data sets. Um, sorry, two validation data sets. Uh, we plot the uh, the predicted risk uh, within, let me step back a bit. These are colorectal cancers, stage two and stage three colorectal cancers. So we plot the predicted risk on the stage two patients only, stage three and then stage two and three. And then we see that whether the predicted risk score can stratify the patients. And what we what we found, if you look at the curves, right? Like the, the model is able to risk stratify the patients into like low, medium, or high risk within uh, the stage, within within the cancer stage. And we kind of like check what check with like the association with like known clinical pathologic variables. And we found that there's like the model is able to uh, it's able to predict the risk score, which is not correlated with those like let's say the T stage, N stage, or M stage, those like known clinical variables. And this suggests that the model has learned some signals that is not being captured by the existing clinical system. And this becomes like super interesting for us, right? We're like super excited. We're like, oh, we have a model that can do really well in predicting outcomes. It seems to have learned something that we don't know what it has learned. Uh, can we go and figure out what it has actually learned? Um, and this comes into the, 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 the question I think a lot of people like to talk about is uh, interpretability, right? People like to call deep learning systems a black box, right? Even though you can understand mechanistically how all the weights are combined, being added through like nonlinearity, but then what does it actually learn? So, so what is interpretability? I think many people have many different definitions, and here's here's our working definition. Our working definition about interpretability is humans can associate some semantic meanings or like stories that to the features that's used by deep learning model. And generally, I think we like to categorize in like, there's like two approaches. One is, I think I call it without the prior hypothesis. One is with the high prior hypothesis. So let me start with the one with the prior hypothesis. With prior hypothesis, essentially it's like, you already have some intuition about what's in the data. And you just want to validate whether the model is actually using that. 
So this is the task, which is um, uh, identifying tumor cells on a uh, breast cancer, uh, uh, a lymph node. And there's a, something called a saliency map. Saliency map is essentially, uh, you can kind of like back prop the gradient and see where in the input image is, is mostly being used in informing uh, the model and predicting whether it's a tumor cell or not. So this is the input, and this is the saliency map. And you might have seen saliency map like many different places. From me, I always feel like it's kind of like reading the tea leaf. And for this, when I talk to pathologists, they're like, yes, this is exactly how I detect, uh, it's looking at the nuclei. And this is exactly how I know whether it's a, it's a kinship cell, because there's like a, a pepperish texture, looking at the nuclei, it's like kind of black and white, like mixture, there's like a pepperish pattern. And so they already have a prior and look at it, yes, this is exactly, oh, the model is interpretable. The other, the other te technique people kind of use is it's called like TCAP. Uh, it was uh, uh, developed by uh, a colleague at Google Brain. And it was like, it was like, if we have a model that can classify horse from zebra, uh, I think we all, know, I think for me maybe, or when I teach kids, it's like my, 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 my kids, it's like, oh, it's looking at a stripe, right? And and this like there's already a known prior hypothesis that like, stripe is something that's a horse from zebra. Can we test it out whether the model is actually using it? But personally, I feel like the most interest, more interesting part is about like without a prior hypothesis, like you don't know what actually is leading to the discovery and you just want to like kind of see whether some new insights or knowledge might occur. You can also do saliency method, but essentially you have to very different mindset to like be very open-minded, look at it and see what might show up. A lot of people these days try to do like image to text generation, like from the embedding and see what are language models if generate something that's like meaningful. Here, the approach that we took is we use something called a uh, we, we use in a image similarity model in combination with a very simple clustering technique. So let me start with like, what is an image similarity model? Um, we use the same model as that's powering uh, Google image search. So I don't know, I, I think maybe, maybe most of you have used Google, Google image search. If you drop an image into Google search bar and it can show you similar images on the internet that look similar. If you drop in, let's say an Eiffel Tower, it should show up a bunch of Eiffel Tower. And underneath it is an image similarity model. It is trained specifically uh, to map input image to embedding space, such that if the image looks visually similar from a human perspective, it is it will be in a similar embedding space within, uh, it will be in a similar, similar location within embedding space. So what we did is we take all the images here and then we feed the patches to the image sim similarity model and then we do a cluster. And this is like every single, this is like the result. Every single row here is a cluster. So there's like, and we, we don't have any prior, right? We have cluster number 72, cluster number 139. I think we did like 200 cluster. And, but if you look at every single row, you see some form of like, you can see why they're in the same cluster. They look like visually similar. And then we combine, uh, our prognostic model. We run these patches through the prognostic model and we see which one, is, whether any of them is most associated with predicting outcomes. And we found a particular cluster, cluster feature, cluster uh, num number 72, it is more associated with outcome than any other clusters. And this is like, if we just look at the quantitation of that particular cluster, you see that it can also do risk ratification uh, within, within stage two and within stage three. And this is just, oh, there, this feature, there's, there's, kind of, there's something there. And uh, we then have a group of pathologists kind of look at, they, we just hand them like a bunch of, because we know what the embedding looks like. We, we just find a bunch of like patches that's within the same cluster and we just hand them to our pathologists and say, hey, can you like describe what's going on? Like, what do you see in this particular cluster? And, and we found that they, they like to call it a, uh, tumor adipose feature essentially is like tumor cells and the fat cells can like mingle together. And, and that's how we can like associate a semantic meaning to this particular feature. And so, so far, right, we have a, we have a model, we derive something that seems to be interesting. It seems to be associated with uh, outcomes. The next question is like, we want to figure out like, 
is this like a new knowledge? And is this something that human can learn from? And so the the the, the follow up study that we did, which published in Jump on It Open like last last year, is can we want to answer the question that can pathologists learn and score these like new feature that was identified the deep learning uh, system that's associated with the co colon uh, cancer survival. So we have uh, a group, we have two pathologists. They look at a bunch of data, like they look at the, the previous data set, they wrote a guideline themselves. They wrote a guideline and say, okay, there's going to be unifocal, there's going to be a multifocal, uh, there's going to be the widespread of like the TAF feature, right? Unifocal is like there's one block, multifocal there's like a few, a, a few blobs of those like features and widespread like over the place. And they say, oh, this is, this is the, 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 the grading system. And, and then, uh, and then we took an independent data set. Uh, the original data set that we derived this derived uh, this feature is from Austria, and then this is an Italian data set. There's about like 260 uh, cases associated with blink outcome, and then the pathologists they learn the guideline, they review these cases on glass. On glass, I mean they look at look look at it from microscope. And then they just like write down what is their grading, and then uh, and then we show that it's actually able to also predict outcomes in terms of doing risk stratification. Like if you look at uh, the overall survival, like the widespread have versus other cases, you see if they could split it apart, and then delete uh, delete specific sur survival also see that there's like the is, is able to do risk stratification. So actually, the learning here is like pathologists can learn like these machine learning discovered tab feature. And it is like reproducible by human. Like initially, it was derived from like deep learning system. It's able to, it's able to reproduce. Human can reproduce it, and then the human reproduced results is also prognostic. So essentially, initially, what mer what machine learning system is doing now it becomes like a knowledge that human can reproduce, uh, and and it was validated on like an external cohort from a different different country. So this kind of close the loop of like what we have been. I think this overall project ran like five years, started from like, initially we want to go from like input image to like predicting outcomes all the way closing the loop of like, oh, we have to, to, to discover a new uh, insight that human can learn from it and then can reproduce it. And for me, I think this suggests like uh, a new paradigm uh, of using AI for, uh, for knowledge discovery. So what do I mean by that? Like think about like the traditional like discovery process, like prostate cancer Gleason grading, right? Dr. Uh, Gleason look at a bunch of slides. He has like a show feeling. I think this is the thing that is like prognostic. They, I, and I think if you talk to a lot of pathologists or a lot of PA, they have like some intuition, like, oh, that thing might have some known, like have some, there might be some signals there. There might be some signals there. Um, and he developed this system, which is still used today. Um, to do uh, prostate cancer gleason grading. And this is done like a, like a very human intuition approach. But then right now, I think with large data, with machine learning system, and we have the ability to test cell, essentially think about the input output pairs, right? For this particular case, input images, output outcomes. Uh, and we, with large enough data, with a large enough model, we should have to train the machine learning system to do that. But you can also change this to other things, right? Input is whatever input outputs like biomarker status, just all kinds of, you can swap out the input outputs and train all kinds of systems to do that. And then if you have a model that's doing pretty well, then there's a possibility in using that to generate like knowledge, hypothesis or insights. And then whether we can use that to teach you, like teach or train human to learn that and then kind of like, and then replicate that. So I think this opens up like, it's, 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 I think there's a lot of like interesting work in this space currently. Um, and this is like a indication of like, I think with the, in the, in the modern paradigm, uh, these knowledge discovery potentially can be done at a larger scale and a, in a very more like more rigorous and more quant quant uh, quantitative approach. Okay, so yeah, these are some of the, publications uh, that I have about uh, uh, that, that I've covered. So this is kind of like the first part of the talk is like essentially a sequence of work 
uh, that that I have done um, uh, at Google uh, talking about like how humans learn from AI. Sorry, how AI learn from human and how humans learn from AI. I think maybe it's a good time for us to pause a bit. I'm happy to take any questions. The second part of I was going to talk about what we're building at, at the current startup. Um, but I'll pause a bit to see whether there's any questions about the very first part. One question. So I, I like very much this idea of like, okay, we have intuition, we build this uh, kind of classification things to help us uh, maybe make decisions easier. Do you think we can use this system to repartition the like uh, kind of, uh, you know, if you were to put the uh, threshold a little more to the left or to the right, uh, is it possible? Because I can imagine what would be really valuable, you know, if we can make this technology cheap, that you can take it to hospitals where maybe the training of pathologists is not as good uh, and you can help them improve or if they cannot use this technology because it would require, I don't know, training, take it to, I don't know, I have to do like, a, let's say you want to take it to a village in Romania where I'm from and you don't have, uh, we have amazing internet, but I maybe don't say uh, we don't have access to these uh, tools. Uh, so if you want to take it to the pathologist because there's not much cancer training right now, and you want to say, hey, here's the Gleason kind of histological grade, here's a new one. Um, would you use this for that? Would yeah. you use that to redesign a new, um, you know, kind of offline? Yeah, yeah. I think for a first question, it's super interesting, right? Because right now, these are categorization is all, it's all kind of like human defined, and these thresholds is like pretty hard, right? If you're a little bit here or a little bit there, right? It's based on the level of differentiation. It's like, it's it's highly, highly subjective. And I think machine learning system, what it can do is potentially, right right now it's based on one, two, three, four, five. Potentially use machine learning system to adjust this. But then I think another idea is why does it have to be we said one, two, three, four, five? Is there like a 1.3, is there like a 1.4, 1 1.5? It can be way more fine grain and even just become like a, a continuous score, right? It doesn't have to be these bucket. If you look at a lot of tasks that pathologists are doing, it's, there are buckets. And these buckets are typically defined with the spirit of minimizing interpathologist variability, minimizing the variability, because variability is always there. So you look at, let's say, like breast cancer, right? Like ERPR status is like less than 10%, right? And 10 is like a very arbitrarily driven decided decided uh threshold and i think like being i i feel like going forward it's just, just going to be more and more and more fine grain and then ultimately it, it might be just a complete continuous score so the second part about like education i think that's that's actually like uh, a super interesting idea and and what we have seen firsthand as, as i mentioned in the earlier part of this talk is like even with u.s board certified pathologists in the study, we showed them 240 cases. If we do like a sliding window, looking at the accuracy, all of their accuracy is going up. <laughs> and 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 I think there's like there's tremendous amount of opportunity in terms of like using this for like an education uh, purpose. And I would say a lot of these scoring like pathologists are doing is is. More or less, it makes sense. Slightly kind of like an art form. There's just like a few people know how to do it like really, really well, like the, the, the world expert. And ideally, if we can have them uh, annotate the data and then have a model distill that knowledge from the data that they have annotated. Yeah. No question. Probably the second part with the the same synapse. I was wondering whether you assess like where maybe the research classification is doing slightly not as well. Uh, does it like correlate like, with certain Um, all those observations are created to uh, certain clusters in your ascendancy maps. 
uh, that could be uh, signals that are interfering with uh, how things are being annotated and how does that knowledge transfer to the recent pat the pattern uh, scoring? Uh, does it even, is it something that could be happening? Mm -hmm. So we actually didn't, I think we actually didn't, so it's actually two studies, one of like the, the salient, the, the clustering, it's a study that we did on the colorectal reason. It's like a, it's a it's a former study. For your first question about like what from the clustering do we have we discovered anything that's how the model might be like not working that well. And one thing that we have found so pathology slides. If you look at the real world data, oftentimes people pathology like to like draw things on the slides. So they are like they are like they are they are markers. And if you do clustering, oftentimes you'll see they are like a couple of clusters, which is those like ink drawing. But then, uh, which is just uh, a very like artificial thing that you show in the data sets. Um, from a risk uh, prognostic prediction capability perspective, we do look at those cluster and see, do they have correlation with outcomes? Um, and it, there's, like, there's two ways to think about it. One way is it can, because like, typically when people draw it, they see the tumor. So there should be some association. But if our model is only learning about those inks, then it's not a model that is very useful, right? What we have discovered is, because I think this is a, a, a aspect that we are very mindful early on. So we kind of like making sure our model is kind of robust against that particular aspect. But when we see uh, the clustering we found that group, and then that group isn't particularly informative in terms of predicting the prognostic, and it's something that 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 I think the publication didn't like include it. Um, does that does that answer your question? And then, but then that doesn't really like feedback into recent, which is like a, a independent project. Cameron, can I ask one quick question as well? Um, the question that comes to my mind is why is the heuristic that your AI has identified prognostic for outcome after approach detectomy to, that suggests perhaps that you pick up a feature that increases the probability that these patients have metastatic disease at the point of the prostatectomy. So rather than you identifying patients who should undergo find patients who shouldn't undergo surgery. Um, so your, your, your question is, what is... What, how can you study what the mechanistic consequence of the heuristic is that your model has learned? So this sort of this, this glandular appearance or this adipose or FAT appearance or TAF appearance that you sort of suggest, so more cystic appearance. What do you think could be done to understand what the relevance of that is for the actual biology of the disease? I see. Um, that's a great question. For our study, we did not address those. I think we were mostly trying to discover correlation. And, and I think there are some interpretability. Interpretability essentially is human associating some story that human understand and feel might be right. Uh, the story that we're associating with it is when the tumor, it's called tumor adipose feature. So it's like tumor and fat cells kind of like mingling together. It's usually a suggestion that it, the, the tumor cells kind of like potentially metastasizing that maybe have indication of like a, a higher risk score. But for the question of like, how can we understand better understand from like a mechanistic perspective. Honestly, I I I I don't I, I don't I don't know. <laughs> I think this is uh this is something that probably require some form of like non compute like kind of like the, the real experiments to, to figure out uh to have a better understanding of the me mechanistic pathway. I think what we have discovered is essentially a clear correlation there. But then to further dive into that, I think it's challenging. And and I think generally for from like a, a deep learning approach, this like really going very deep and understanding like the the pathway, the mechanism, is something I don't think the the community has a deep understanding of like how to do that effectively.
Thank you. Two more questions uh, from online. Okay. Um, do you want to address those at the end? Uh, I would love to hear about them. The startup? Yeah. Okay. Uh, how much time do I have? Okay. <laughs> we can ask these questions at the end of the conversation. Okay. Okay. Then let me. Okay. Let me do. Uh, I, let me do the the startup overview. Um. So, me and our mission is we want to make sure that anyone anywhere can achieve the best possible cancer health outcomes. Uh, we are founded by uh, two doctors. Uh, our, our, our CEO, he was a radiation oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, but he was, he was in New York for a very, very long time. And our, the other uh, of our co-founders is a pathologist. The problem that we have discovered is that cancer care complexity has like drastically increased throughout the years. Uh, started from like, let's say in the 40s, uh, Sydney Farber's invented uh, like chemotherapy to like DNA sequencing to CRISPR to like CAR T cell. The complexity has drastically increased. And the increase in that complexity leads to two potential problems. One problem is that the cancer delivery infrastructure, like the hospital, is like highly overwhelmed. Uh, a lot of tasks, like let's say pathology, they're asking to do is, from my perspective, like highly like, inhumane, right? Asking pathologists to do metabolic counting, asking pathologists to estimate tumor percentage within a, within a tissue, which is like not a hu humanly suited task. The other problem that it arises is like the cancer care financial infrastructure is overwhelmed. Like people don't have the money to pay for the cancer care. And are like these complexity leading to kind of somewhat a failure in the treatment delivery system. This is like for every single step, you should think about the cancer diagnosis and treatment. It goes from data input, data analysis, treatment planning, treatment delivery, every single step, there's like a lot of variability, right? If you look at the, the the prostate cancer example, right? There's a lot of variability in terms of like diagnosis. And for a patient, let's say if they are being treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering versus who knows, like let's drive like two hours west and hit another hospital for the same patient, they will very likely receive very different diagnosis and treatment at these two different hospitals. And different diagnosis and treatment will very likely lead to different outcomes. What does it lead to is I actually if you look at the stats, most of the world, 90% of the people, they are not being treated at Global Center of Excellence. They are not being treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering. They are not being treated at Mount Sinai. Um, they are tre being treated at a local hospital. And this leads to a disparity in outcomes. If you look at the stats, this is like, if you look at, this is five-year survival. It's comparing Global Center of Excellence versus others. Global Center of Excellence, 85%. And you see like a massive gap throughout all the different regions. So this is one of this is a, a, a pretty big issue. The other aspect is like right now, um, there's a notion of financial toxicity. Financial toxicity is a notion that not having money is actually worse than not getting the right drug. You can look at the hazard ratio, you can look at the outcomes. There's a lot of studies at ASCO showing uh, published at ASCO showing this. In the US, like 40% of the people uh, with cancer uh, went into debt within two years, they depleted their life saving. And, and this has caused like a tremendous amount of uh, influence on, on the outcomes. So for me, what we do is we want to, we partner with global insurers uh, and we want to fix the problems that's caused by, it started from increasing cancer care complexity. And, I want to highlight like increasing care complexity is a great thing. There's a lot of new tools, there's a lot of new technology that can help patient manage, manage patient, treating patient. But that complexity leading to two problems, cancer care delivery infrastructure is overwhelmed, cancer burden, uh, financial burden is overwhelmed. And we partner with insurance company such that we want to provide like what we call a physical protection, protect users from potential cancer harm. And then the insurance company protects the financial protection, protecting uh, users from the potential financial burden. Typically, a lot of like convention and insurance policy, they don't care about whether people have the right prevention screening. They don't care about whether you have the right diagnosis, just like something happened, they pay all the money. And then people whether have the right workup item, have the right treatment, have the right survivorship, have the right follow-up. It's not insurance companies, business. they just 
they just give out money, right? You can pay the premium, something bad happens to you, you give the money, and then that's it. Uh, what we wanted to do, we wanted to have a very deep integration with insurance uh, policies such that people making sure people have the right prevention, the right screening, uh, people have the early diagno diagnosis if something bad happened to them, payment, right workup, right treatment, and the right survivorship. Our product, we call it a cancer protection system. There are two apps. There is a need app, which is in the policy holder. It's we tie to the insurance policy, so that's why it's the policy holder. It's in the policy holders that help the users throughout their health journey. When they're healthy, help them with lifestyle prevention and screening. If they're unfortunately get sick during the treatment, help them with mental health side effect. After the treatment, help them with follow-up. We also have another product called Hero App, which is an information platform that is supporting the cancer doctors such that with the right information, so they can deliver the best uh, outcomes. So Need App, uh, as I mentioned, this is like uh, an app that so you can actually download from the Apple Store or like Android Store, um, and it helps it, it follow the user through all the journey because we bundle with insurance policy. Insurance policies follow the users. We follow the users through all their health journey. And this is the, the Hero app. It's a multimodality information platform such that it, it, also it also has the ability to do like pathologic review, radiology review with human in the loop, and then, and then facilitate collaboration with global clinicians uh, around the world. So let me kind of like walk through how, how this works. Let's say if there's a particular policy holder, if they unfortunately get cancer, we will have operator go and meet the policy holder We'll get their consent. With their consent, we can go to the hospital, get all of their data, including pathology slides. We digitize them ourselves, radiology images, medical record, and we digitize all the data we upload into our cloud platform. Currently, we have more than 120 cancer doctors across the world. And then uh, these doctors work with our AI in analyzing the case uh, and then deliver the information back to the local doctors. And this is kind of like and to make sure that the, the local doctors is empowered with the information to provide the optimal diagnosis and treatment. So let's say we are actually operating in a lot of like countries that is like, like let's say in a, in, a, in a rural clinic, there's a single oncologist, a single person need to see 10 different types of cancer. ASCO just came out, there's like 2000 papers, right? 2000 abstracts about like all the new diagnosis and treatment for a single doctor, it's just kind of like, really difficult for the person to keep up. My, my analogy in the machine learning world, if you like someone asked me, are you keep up with things are happening in the machine learning world? I say like, definitely no, right? There's like, there's like every day, there's like hundreds of archive paper. No, no one is keep up with like all the latest development of the machine learning world. And I would say a similar thing for like oncology, right? It's hard for oncologists to be able to keep up with like all the things that's happening in, in, the, in the cancer world. So we want to provide an information platform that is supporting the doctors with all the all the latest research, all the guidelines, and then we also help validate it, all of the information that we have got from uh, the hospital. Uh, what we are trying to do is we are also trying to curate uh, an unprecedented global data sets because we partner with the insurance company. We have access to some of the financial actuarial data. When they're healthy, we have an app in user's pocket. We get their lifestyle data. During treatment, we get data from the hospital after survivorship. and. In the survivorship module, we also have the follow-up data and the potential the outcome data. And we want to use this uh, to, in to integrate these multimodality longitudinal data and then ultimately develop our machine learning system to help with, there's, there's all kinds of different, different opportunities. The first part that we're focusing on is our treatment module, which is like the whole diagnosis and treatment workflow. And so what we do today is we have all kinds of different data that we comes in. We have AI driven process. We have human working with our AI. Most of the time is AI creating a draft and then human kind of validate it, proofread it before passing it on to the next step. We have more than 120 cancer subspecialties across the world. It covers all cancer types, cover all subspecialties, like pathologists, radiologists, medical oncologists, surgical oncologists, radiation oncologists, and there's like more. And then and and then, and then, and then we are kind of like uh, taking all the data of like these oncologists that they're inputting into our cases and then pull it back in further improving uh, our system. One of the first systems that we develop is the, the task of like creating a clinical summary. So we just get a bunch of data from the hospital and then typically we have a team of clinical nurse trying to summarize it. It can take them like an hour if we're lucky, un unlucky they're like two, two days. And then now we have an AI assistant and then we have shown that the AI assisted summaries uh, in the blindest studies actually preferred over 
uh, like the human written one by a group of oncologists. Uh, in the longer term, we actually also want to get the outcome data and using the outcome data to really drive a lot of AI systems that were developed instead of going back to the initial part, instead of directly train model based on human annotation, we want to train the model directly from outcomes. And yeah, our goal is we want to close the uh, global survivorship gap. Okay, that's a, a super quick, super quick run of uh, what a startup is doing. We are two minutes over time, but I think we can ask those two questions or depending on. Thank you so much for so there are two questions for like argument that we put there. One of them was uh, regarding the number of clusters, like when you have like around 200 clusters, how do you decide on that number? And I believe it was from Joey. And the second question was regarding generalizability. So if you have different types of image data and you train, I assume from one type of cancer to another one, how generalizable are these approaches generally for? Whether there are other non cancer diseases where you might care about outcome prediction. Yeah. So for the first one, I think it's uh, like essentially a hyperparameter. Then you can kind of like try it out and you can look at the amount of variance, like the cluster kind of explain. And it's, we think we pick 200, just like there, there, there's no proof, there's no theoretical underpinning, but that's kind of like how, how we go about that. For the second one, question about like how things are generalizable, I think for the survival, uh, prediction study. This one is about colorectal cancer, but we actually did an earlier study uh, that's using TCGA. Uh, we tried to do it kind of like pan cancer uh, across all cancer types. Uh, it didn't work that well. I think there are two reasons. First and foremost is like pan cancer, generally there's a lot of heterogeneity. It just makes the problem much more challenging. And the second is we also try only using one cancer type within TCGA. Like I think with a TCJ for a single cancer type, you probably have like roughly 1,000 cases. That's not sufficient. And for our TCJ study to the one I showed on the slide, to the colorectal study, essentially it's exactly the same method. If you look at our paper, it just referred to the previous paper on the same method, but we just drastically scale up the data set. And that's the key difference um, of like why the, the, the model is actually working much better than, than, than the TCJ one. But pan cancer generally is like it's a it's a it's a challenging task, but luckily I think in pathology it's also like I think there's some hope. People have been talking about like pan cancer for radiology. There's it's even different modality, right? CT and MRI, like all kinds of different PET scan, and that's like that's a that's a, another layer of complexity. Any other questions? again. All right. Thank you.